we have had a very strong and uh, important revival of interest in the esoteric teachings of the past in recent years. And among the various emphases that have come back into focus is the story of the adept tradition. I have studied that rather carefully, probably, for close to 50 years, and have written extensively on it, so that my general position, I suspect, is fairly well established and known. But there is a new dimension that has been introduced into the problem involving an adjustment with contemporary thinking. And this, it seems to me, is important enough to devote a little time and consideration to exploring it. The adept tradition as we know it today came from the past and probably from the ancient Indo-Aryan civilizations of Asia. The earliest accounts that we have bearing upon the subject have certainly originated in India. And the Indian situation is somewhat different from anything in the West, so we have to orient a little to it. The Vedas and uh, the great Puranas of India discuss the mystery of days gone by when the gods walked with men. We find the same myths and legends arising in other parts of the world. But in India we have a situation that has not been repeated anywhere else of a natural indigenous structure. The adept tradition in India unfolds through a series of mystics, esotericists, yogins, Vedantins, many other schools of thought represented in the world by gurus or teachers. These teachers were part of a hierarchy. They were not tied tightly to any worldly organization, but they were tied to a spiritual descent from antiquity. The gurus accepted disciples on various levels of attainment and subjected them to extraordinary disciplines. East Indian religion in its primitive form was a highly disciplined system. Those who followed it gave their lives to the conquest of their own individual weaknesses. Uh, they began with all type of physical uh, austerity. They restricted and limited all negative or de detrimental propensities of temperament. They had to gain complete inward placidity. They had to have an overwhelming faith and a strength and courage which would enable them uh, to overcome any delinquencies of moral or ethical character which they might have brought with them into this world. As a result of continual discipline, the disciples ascended from one level of teachers to another toward a mysterious spiritual structure, this mysterious world of the adepts and initiates, the invisible government of the earth. These people believed firmly that there was an administrative body composed of highly perfected human beings and in some instances teachers from other life waves who contributed to the protection and advancement of mankind. It was first appropriate and proper to recognize such an institution invisible to the average person, unknown to a great many but necessary to the construction and unfoldment of humanity. These teachers, invisible, these rishis, these arhats, were actually elder brothers. They contributed to the protection of the young souls growing up in nature. They were very much like the ancestors in a family, the elders. 
And as such, they were known in a great many nations and among many tribes and peoples. But the disciple had as his final goal that he might become worthy to be an instrument in the fulfillment of the divine plan. This divine plan originated by deity, administered by hierarchy, and finally disseminated throughout the world through spiritualized teachers. This was the mysterious structure upon which the future and destiny of the whole plan of things depended. Now when we realize that in Asia we had this tremendous dedication, we can begin to understand why it is difficult to transfer that dedication from the highlands of the Himalayas to the condominiums of America. There is a tremendous interval here between the spiritual way of life and the highly economic industrial type of existence with which we are generally familiar. Almost all the sacred books of the world, regardless of their nationality or their dating, include the factor of an invisible government the overwhelming hierarchy principle. Theology has generally overlooked this in the West, but on the other hand, it is indispensable to an understanding of nature and life, and a great many philosophers have given a great deal of thought to it. In the first place, if we wish to assume the presence of deity and the Godhead, a trinity, or a triunity in unity, and also realize or believe that this power controls, directs, and judges the existence of all living things, it becomes inevitable that there must be something in the interval between deity and humanity. It is inconceivable that deity can administer the whole universal procedure, either by itself or by means of a small group of divine beings. It is much easier to believe that this administrative structure, highly conditioned, highly de developed, represents a complete technical structure of over-government, of divine administration, it is as though you said of a large corporation that a, a corpor corporation like Standard Oil or General Foods consists of a president, a board of direction, directors, and office boys. There has to be something between. There has to be managers, department heads. There had to be specialists in many different fields to administer a great corporation. And the universe is the greatest of all corporations for its very structure is the basis of all integration, all organization, and all distribution of authority in nature. So it did not seem unreasonable to the Oriental mind that there had to be this invisible hierarchy, that there had to be a tremendous invisible machinery administering the visible phenomena of life, that this machinery had to take care of everything, from the motion of the cosmos to the sparrow's fall. There had to be a tremendous over something, greater than anything we can even imagine, as we look out into space and see a, a magnificent distribution of light in the sky, stars, galaxies, nebula, all kinds of structure out there we have to realize that something is running this, something is ruling it, something is administering it. And the sages of High Asia were convinced that the visible world as we see it is merely an appendage to a great invisible process that we do not see, but which we can learn to appreciate or understand. The first step, therefore, in the training of the chelas or disciples the first step was to become aware of the importance of a great process behind the obvious. 
that there was something more to know than we can find in school books, that there were reasons for things that transcend the common economic impulses with which we are familiar today. It became evident to these ancient sages that man was not here simply to build a material world. He was not here to advance personal fortune or dignity or estate. He was not here to conquer. There was something much more important in life. Finally, he was here to be a servant of the tremendous plan which sustained him and of which he was a part. It didn't seem at all unreasonable, therefore, to these elders that the disciples should become aware of the need for this procedure, that having discovered that there was a purpose in life greater than the ordinary human purpose, that the disciple should prepare himself for this purpose, that he should dedicate himself to whatever improvement would make him valuable to the advancement of the grand purpose or the eternal principle of progress. In this concept, therefore, he went through disciplines, disciplines which not only purified the body, but also relieved the mind of prejudices and conceits and opinions, and gradually unfolded what the ancient believed to be the most important part of man, and that was the extrasensory and spiritual basis of human existence. Ultimately, then, the idea was that each faithful disciple would in turn be promoted into a more important capacity, not to gratify his personal ambitions, but to give opportunity to the improvements which he had attained within himself. It was not that these improvements should make him proud or more worldly, or that he should use them to advance his personal fortunes. It was that these improvements made him more useful in the great purpose for which all life is basically intended. From this highland belief, then, <clears throat> came the doctrine that in the heart of Asia uh, there was what was originally the North Polar Cap, but that this cap has now moved due to other motions of the planet until it is in the desert of Gobi, and that here was a mysterious center, the spiritual core from which the invisible government of the world functioned in the material existence. This government impressed itself by means of enlightened, dedicated, illumined creatures, persons. Perhaps we would call them gods, but the Greeks like to think of them as heroes, an heroic order of life between divinity and humanity. And in the Odyssey of Homer, and the Iliad and the Aeneid of Virgil, we find references to these heroes, those who had transcended mortal limitation and at death were lifted up to become planets and constellations. These were symbolic terms to indicate the advancement of those who had appropriate dedications and lived to achieve victory over the worldliness and ignorance in themselves. If we consider, therefore, this oriental point of view, we can see how it drifted into Buddhism from its ancient Hindu foundation. In Buddhism, we have the entire concept of the arhats and of the great teachers brought forth in a very simple and direct way in which the universal laws were administered by dedicated human beings who had become worthy to receive instruction. The Lotus Sutra of Buddha, the great apocalyptic sutra, describes this procedure in which the divine beings from ten galaxies assemble to hear the revelation of the Lotus of the Perfect Law. The whole of Buddhism is a visible shadow cast by an invisible structure of integrities, insights, and dedication. It also it was made up not only of the higher orders of life, the hierarchies, descending into material existence, but mortals ascending gradually out of materiality and towards a divine state, so that in a middle ground the divine and the human met 
in a solid dedication to principles and truth. We have the same teachings in Taoism in China. We have it in the dervish philosophies and mysticisms of Islam. We have the prophets and the sacred teachers of the Old Testament. And we have the mystics and esotericists that arose in Christianity. All of these systems essentially had a dedication, a reason why human beings should be better than they might normally be. The uh, idea of self-improvement in the uh, esoteric tradition is very different from our concept of self-improvement in the mortal world. Today we think of self-improvement as health, as improvement of a state. We think that self-improvement is to be richer, to be more fortunate, to be more glamorous, to hold public office, to uh, achieve distinction among others, and that knowledge is simply a method of organizing and reorganizing the structure of our material existence. Therefore, we spend many years training to be computer operators. We spend many other years in terms of becoming diplomats or scientists or doctors. We become involved in great professional dedications. We become artists and architects and poets and writers, musicians. But some way, for the most part, all of our efforts are directed towards the enhancement of our material estate. We seek fame, distinction, recognition, and honor in this world. The esoteric tradition approaches this matter a little differently. The question that they have always asked, and which has been difficult for most people to answer, is when we leave here, of what we have here, what can we take with us? Will a good education in accounting uh, work for our favor in a universe in which accounting as we know it has no existence? Does wealth go beyond the grave? Is fame and distinction something that has significance outside of this world? And for the most part, if we think clearly and carefully, we have to answer in the negative. There is very little we specialize here that is good for us anywhere else. It is important simply because of the world we live in, the condition of society, the degree of advancement of learning and arts and sciences here. Beyond this, most of the attainments that we give our lives to can have no enduring significance. Recognizing this, it was easy for some of the ancient peoples uh, to rise above the lure and temptation of material existence. This was one of the reasons for which uh, the ancient scriptures were dedicated. There is another reason also that assuming <coughs> that it is possible for the individual to know more about the grand structure of existence, then it is also possible for him to do better here and now in his material state. The more understanding he possesses, the more secure he can become, not only in spiritual values, but in his relation to the material environment in which he lives. Now, as we go along from one country to another, we find various names for these mysterious higher personalities. We have various uh, stories of where they came from and why they're here and how they uh, function and operate. But essentially, we realize or recognize them mostly through symbolism, which is a language of uh, the pictures or word patterns which we must interpret in terms of inner insight. If we imagine that instead of a world simply filled with space and dark holes called in the nebulas, we recognize that behind a veil what the ancient Mayas called the azure veil of sky. Behind this was a tremendous structure, a structure so meaningful uh, that uh, it brought the individual down in absolute abject uh, humility. Uh, this type of experience was awarded to Jacob Bamey, the German mystic, who, on, you know, who in his meditations and mystical contemplations was given a vision 
of the way the universe opened up, the way that Dante saw the space the cosmos as a tremendous open rose with hierarchies upon each of the petals, that somewhere behind this blank wall which seems to surround us is a greater world than we have ever known, a world of purposes, of meaning, a world not bound to material or economic structures, but a world belonging to infinite life and its continuing manifestation for the purpose of the unfoldment of the spiritual content in all things that live. Now as we go down a little further, we come to another interesting pattern that presented itself. About the beginning of the Christian era, perhaps a little earlier, uh, there was a traffic between Asia and Europe. And this traffic centered in a few great cities like Ephesus, Antioch, and Alexandria. And we find the Arab tradition beginning to emerge in contact with Western peoples, particularly through Egypt. In this particular area, the Neoplatonists, the Gnostics, and several other groups of mystics began to teach more openly in the West the belief in this grand plan of things, the belief that everything in the universe was lawful, that there was no such a thing as an accident or a mistake, that all the unfoldments of life, evolution in all its manifestations, was, were part of one tremendous pattern, a pattern invisible to the common perception, but to be glimpsed or apperceived in meditation or mystical experiences. Out of this also came another elaborate Egyptianized form, and that was ritual. Here, dramatic presentations were given to aspirants and disciples and students that they might behold symbolically the great order of the world, that they might also experience within themselves symbolically their own place in this plan and how it assisted them in the dedication of life to significant purpose. This is the, perhaps the key to the whole thing, the dedication of life to significant purpose. From the uh, Alexandrian time, we have the rise of things like the Hermetic philosophies. A mysterious adept, Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus, a strange phantom-like figure, was perhaps the first important Western concept of the adept, a mysterious power the mind of God made flesh, the wisdom of the eternal, brought into a communicable form in the great teacher. Hermes was the, considered to be the author of all the books that were ever written in the world. No one ever saw him. No one ever found out who he really was. No authentic history of him is known. Yet we are forced to assume that a tremendous motion in society does not arise from nothing. It has to have a core. It has to have a motivating principle. And this motivating principle, as Hermes, was invisible, but the source of a tremendous visible transformation in the life of humanity. So we find gradually the rise of systems in the West, the Kabbalists, under Rabbi Akiva's influence and Rabbi Simeon ben Yochoi gave us the Zohar, the Book of the Splendors, the story of the great face and the lesser face, the story of the eternal throne forever, surrounded by hierarchy, by tremendous emanations of beings, purposed to the life and improvement of mankind. We have the same tradition in Central America, among the American Indian groups, and in North America, but we have the mysterious lodge in the sky, the mysterious abode of the wise. And in this mysterious lodge, where they sat in council forever, uh, these wise ones, the olds and the trues, administered the fortunes of mankind. And the medicine priests were able to leave their material forms and go to the great lodge in the sky for instruction. And sometimes the priest took with him a disciple, whom he taught also to depart from the material form and attend the great 
council of the sanctums in the lodge in heaven. These are Indian beliefs of tribes widely separated, with no language in common, scattered over a great continent, and the three parts of that continent, North, Central, and South America, all with the same intuitive understanding of what is occurring. This un intuitive understanding probably arose from the medicine priests, those who from birth were dedicated to the service of truth. You could have no assignment in life except to serve the need of the tribe. All these experiences brought many legends and myths and stories into existence. The mythologies of nearly all races and nations involve this mysterious circumstance. So now we will bring it down to our purpose to the beginning of the 17th century in Europe, where for the most part our present thoughts on the matter are centered. Around the year 1614, a mysterious proclamation appeared in Europe called the Fame and Confession of the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross. It was signed, presumably, by the members of an esoteric order, an order that was not to be found anywhere in the mortal world, an order which never received candidates, but selected for its <coughs> itself those whom it regarded as worthy. This particular documentation, followed by the chemical marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz, caused a tremendous furor, for it was really nothing more or less than to introduce into Europe the, the concept of the over-government of the adepts. It met, as might be expected, tremendous resistance. It also met a great deal of hope and anxiety for its success in the hearts and minds of those who were seeking greater enlightenment. So for nearly 20 years, this particular group remained a phantom structure in the philosophy, science, and political life of Europe. During this time, many tracts were written, several hundred little publications were made, in which persons who felt that they were worthy to be contacted tried to make some contact with the Brothers of the Rosy Cross. Not knowing where to write, who to turn to, they published little tracts, hoping that they would come into the hands of the proper persons. This went on for years, but so far as is known, no one ever received an answer. No one ever had any direct contact uh, in the sense of being allowed to enter in or share in this mystery. In Europe, probably, the most important of the mysterious adepts was called Elias the Artist. He was the great patron saint of the alchemists. And alchemy became, perhaps, the front door to the open, the, the gate to the shut palace of the king, as reported in some of the ancient rites. <clears throat> The alchemists were the ones who sought to establish a legitimate contact through self-discipline. The alchemists were following the yoga and Vedanta and Buddhist principles of Asia, namely that the only way to contact the hierarchy was through self-improvement. In some mysterious way, the individual had to do what uh, Fitzgerald tells us in the Rubaiyat, where he writes, and from my base metal must be made the key to unlock the door the dervish howls without. Somehow the individual himself had to become the thing before he could discover it. So almost all alchemy, as Basil Valentine, Raymond Lilly, and most of the great masters of the art admitted, Alchemy was not a transmutation of base metals, a but a transmutation of man, a complete reorganization of his own nature, the gradual release of the spiritual powers of the inner life and the power to control, this way, the functions of the outer body. So the moral structure of alchemy <clears throat> became its most fascinating aspect. But still, 
We have only legends. These legends, however, like the ones of the East, have persisted, have gone on, and have continued to intrigue us for centuries past, and will probably do so for centuries to come. Among those who achieved various degrees of enlightenment in these matters, the Church boasted Albertus Magnus, the uh, mysterious priest chemist who achieved the transmutation. Then there was Paracelsus von Hohenheim, the mysterious chemist mystic who gave to the world a tremendous amount of medical skill, knowledge, and has been regarded as the father of pharmacopoeia or the preparation of medicines. Then there were others equally mysterious. Uh, Ripley, who's the old abbot whose scroll described the whole growth of the human soul. And little by little, these mysterious persons uh, contributed something to knowledge in a way that is a little difficult for us to even appreciate. And yet all of them, although writing at this time, you uh, said in their writings as apologists that they were not members of this mysterious society. Michael Meyer published an edition of the Laws of the Rosy Cross, but denied that he was a member. One after another, these people uh, tried to reach the order, and it gradually all faded out. Not because it didn't exist, or the people didn't have faith in it. It had already taken over in Islam. It was a powerful part of the life of Persia. Everywhere it went, it dominated. But it was always mysterious. The dervishes had their adepts, but the dervish had to wait. He could not hunt out and find these teachers for himself. So gradually things drifted along until around 1660, when it is presumed that another voice was heard out of this mystery of the adept tradition. This voice was John Hayden, a young man who was peculiarly ad adapted to be a transmitter of knowledge. He is this, actually, who more or less directly involved Bacon in the story and probably was in power to do so. But uh, Hayden described the Brothers of the Rosy Cross as a mysterious fraternity inhabiting the suburbs of heaven and servants of the Generalissimo of the world. This is a very nice definition, and it was the definition that has influenced nearly every bit of thinking since. The problem was very obvious, and it sums down to what we have now come to, be, to believe to be the contemporary focus. Namely, that there is a mysterious integrity behind life. There are forces working for the improvement of mankind. Every great teacher of the world has admitted this. Most of them have declared that they were commissioned to bring their message, commissioned by this mysterious group that did not appear but labored for the good of mankind. So we come to the present focus where the world, confused, disturbed, and in great tragedy of personal and collective existence, is beginning to go back again to the old idea. Is there a power beyond our own by means of which all things move together according to law? If there is a tremendous invisible government of the earth, if the way that life is to go and the future of humanity and all other species is already established in an archetype, where are these mysterious powers? How can we contact them? How can we know more about them? And if we cannot know these things, how can we at least have a constructive faith in the power of these organizations or this mysterious government to regulate the destiny of empires. I think the Bible and most other books do give us uh, a key. We are, I think, unable to study scriptures without coming to the conclusion that there is something beyond our ordinary human problems and efforts working to control and direct the destiny of mankind that there is a spiritual purpose, a spiritual integrity, seems to be 
an inevitable necessity. It doesn't mean that we have to believe something fantastic. Rather, it seems as though if we did not believe this, we would fall into fantasy. That there has to be a plan. That this plan has to have resulted from a planner. And this planner, in turn, must unfold the plan through a proper organization of processes and beings capable of administering the divine purpose. So now we come down to the problem as it is with us today, that a gradually increasing belief is coming back to us out of the past, that there is a destiny that shapes our ends, rough-hew them though we may, that we are not floating on the surface of something that has no substance, that birth is not a beginning nor death an end that we are not simply shipwrecked on a barren planet in space where we must continue until we destroy the planet with our own ingenuity. These kind of thoughts are desperately detrimental. We can't live with them. We cannot live unless somewhere in our nature we believe that life is significant and we look around us and find very little evidence on the material plane of a significant life. We have to go behind the azure veil. We have to try to imagine, at least, the tremendous machinery by which visible things are maintained. We have to realize that the universal construction, like the human body, the macrocosm, which is the same as the microcosm, according to Hermes, that these two structures are symbolic of each other, that both are involved in the mystery of creation. If we want to find the hierarchy in the material world, the most simple possible way of approaching this is to look around us. So in London, uh, uh, Christopher Wren built the great cathedral of St. Paul. They put a tablet in the wall saying to, if you want to know Wren, look around you. In other words, the building itself. If we wish to know the builder, look around us at the world as it is, not just political and structural, but that world which man does not control, the mysterious world of life and life processes, the mysterious relationships of living things. More and more we are becoming ecology conscious. More and more we are studying the various forms of life that inhabit the planet. And we are becoming consistently more concerned with man's relationship to the rest. And we are deciding gradually that man must give more attention to his relationship with the divine life plan than with merely the advancements of his material fortunes. So with this thought in mind, we have the problem of the adept tradition coming back into focus. And we can say to ourselves, how are we going to administer this problem? How are we going to take something we can't see, dealing with persons and beings we cannot possibly actually visualize? and also dealing with principles with which we are not equipped, equipped to handle constructively. We have to go back to the same thing that was true in India. There is only one protection to the human being who begins to investigate the unseen and the unknown, and that protection is his own integrity. There is no possible way in which he can protect himself except by the constant protection of his own honor. He must arise above all personal considerations. The gurus of India, the first thing that they taught their disciples was that the individual is not to keep his mind on the possibility of his own spiritual perfection. That he is not to be concerned with being greater than somebody else. That those in the spiritual hierarchy who would become the greatest must be the servants of all, as Jesus told his disciples. Therefore, self-ambition, the desire for the fulfillment of some attitude in our own daily living, can be fatal to our integrity and lead into a great deal of self-deceit and open us to the deceptive processes of others. So in the first place that we have to try to do, where we're looking for something we cannot see, is to try to recognize that the real answer to this mystery lies for us in the gradual unfoldment of our own insights concerning life. Well, there are several ways of doing this, of course. 
there are in existence a great many valuable landmarks and valuable works that can be of assistance to us. The ancients, both of the East and West, have left us a fairly good description of what we're looking for. They have left us an understanding of the plan and pattern by which the world is directed. We have the right in the beginning simply to accept or reject. We can't do anything else. We can say, yes, I believe. No, I do not believe. Because at this point, there is no way of becoming certain. Certainty comes at the end of effort, not at the beginning of it. All things move from hope to certainty. All things move from faith to fact. The facts cannot become cannot come first because they must result from the effect of faith upon our own conduct. All things move from faith to fact. The facts cannot become cannot come first because they must result from the effect of faith upon our own conduct. So we say to ourselves, we can study the Vedas, we can study the great Buddhist scriptures, we can study the mandalas and the meditation symbols. We can read the ancient writings concerning the esoteric orders. We can do all these things. And they may give us a certain sensitivity. They may help us to prepare ourselves for the first active participation on our own part. We can say to ourselves, reading or studying these things, that they seem reasonable. And why do they seem reasonable? because they explain values which we are all seeking, but which are not to be found in the common daily living of mankind. There seems to be a reason why virtue should triumph. There seems to be a reason why effort should be rewarded according to its kind. There seems to be a reason why somewhere in the lurking in the background of things is justice. Without some faith in these integrities, we are completely lost, and we are more or less in that condition of being completely lost now. We are very largely committed to trivia. We are also gradually infected with the idea that where there are no certainties, there is no reason for integrity, that there is no reason why we should try to be better than we are if it is all going to end in an oblivion. If there is no consciousness after death, if there is no survival of some part of the inner life of man, then all morality on the material plane is undermined. Some will answer that there is, it's possible to be ethical without being a believer in a divine plan. This is potentially true. That individual can be honest because he believes in honesty. But the price of honesty on that basis of, of belief is very high. The individual who believes that he must try to be honest, but has no concept of an honest universe, is at a disadvantage. He will be constantly uh, struck by the pressures of external circumstances. He will be tempted and tempted again, almost beyond his human strength to resist. He will have no strength from within himself to support what might be his ethical conviction. It is far better, therefore, to realize that ethics is a solid fact supported by the whole universe, and that the laws of ethics cannot be violated without disaster to all concerned. It is somewhere in this problem of cause and effect, of reward and punishment, of growth through effort and dis disintegration uh, through neglect of effort. These are the factors that somehow must gradually come into focus. We have to believe in a life bigger than this or we cannot live well here. We have to believe in a power greater than our own, or our own small strength will fail. Now, it doesn't seem to be very necessary to have a tremendous imagination in order to believe in values. Every day in our material way of life, we are accepting without question and without proof attitudes which we allow to take over our lives for no good reason. We are constantly believing that which is not true, simply because it is popular, because everybody thinks that way, or because it seems more profitable.
But if we gain a certain satisfaction from believing that which is not true, how much greater satisfaction awaits the individual who believes that which is true. And wherever there is truth, there is improvement. Wherever is, there is truth, there is progress. And all truth and progress lead to peace and the integration of the human personality. Now then, coming to our present world affairs, we have a great many people today who are looking for spiritual strength. They are looking for help in their problems and in their uh, concerns. And many of them are beginning to think in terms of hierarchy, in thinking in terms of the strengthening power of a more constructive belief. Now, when this comes along, we always also have the doubting Thomas. We have the individual who will believe that he can put his finger in the wound. But in this particular case, we are again at a disadvantage. The average person is not in a position to weigh, estimate, and validate various beliefs and doctrines that are gradually gaining circulation. The individual does not know how to determine what constitutes the true expression of hierarchy and that which in one way or another is itself a fantasy. We do not know or do not have the skill for the most part of determining the qualities of the values which are communicated to us in the terms of an esoteric tradition. We are not able to tell for certain what is the source of a certain idea or a certain doctrine or the validity of a certain organization, or the integrity of a basic conviction about life that may arise in our environment. How can we evaluate these things? How can we avoid delusion and illusion? How can we be sure that the particular belief that we have is founded in enlightenment, in true esotericism, or perhaps like too many exploiting problems of today, it is gradually being dominated by an, an ex, uh, exploitation concept. In other words, are we going to find the true thing that we seek, or are we going to be imposed upon again? This is always a grave question. The ancients faced it, and those today <coughs> who believe in esoteric things will have to face it again. The answer lies, of course, in one thing, integrities. The individual will have to use his own faculties to determine the validity and integrity of the things he believes. He is going to have to judge his own conduct. He is going to have to consider his own relationship with life. Why is he seeking is the first problem. Why is he trying to know more than he knows now? Why does he want to get in contact with these mysterious invisibles? Well, there's a big question. Most people who believe that they want this contact believe they are looking for it in a sincere and admirable manner. But in a great many instances, even an ordinary family psychologist can point to their shortcomings. Most people looking for more enlightenment cannot escape from the concept of self-advancement. I know people come frequently for advice. Some want to be enlightened because they're sick and they want to get well. Some want to be enlightened because of family problems. Some want to be enlightened because of their romantic interests. Some wish to get further financial support. Others wish to escape the hatreds and unpleasantness that, has, that have burdened them all their lives. Some want to escape from the world. They want to find in philosophy an, an illumined form of death, a transition into another sphere where they will be no longer burdened with the problems that are here. Many different motives uh, are found. And uh, most, of the, most of the time, the people you discuss these matters with have to restate their own motives before a discussion is over. They start in by saying that they want this or they want that or they believe this. And then after a little discussion, they begin to amend their own previous statements because it gradually dawns upon them that their statement of motive is not right. The search for truth depends almost completely upon the problem of motive. 
The motive is the all-important thing. And motive to most people, like most theological problems, is consolation. They want to rest in peace in a world in confusion. They wish to have the kind of insight which will enable them to face the problems of the outer life more successfully. They do not recognize that there is a motive higher than this, and that the esoteric system is all based upon the ultimate motive, and that ultimate motive is the service of truth itself, a complete dedication to the service of the realities of existence. It is only through this type of dedication that there is any possibility, as the Neoplatonists pointed out, of that mysterious inward moment in which the individual, without any real intention or without any real desire for it, is suddenly in the presence of the reality, simply because he has come to deserve it. And the moment it is deserved, it is there. And according to the Hermetic tradition of the Adept doctrine, when the disciple is ready, the teacher appears. Now, this was part of the alchemical theory. The old alchemists worked a lifetime in their laboratories with their bottles and their chemicals and their retorts and their furnaces. And they worked and they struggled and they tried and they gave everything they had to it. And then one night, for no reason whatever, sometime along the line, the mysterious stranger appears. He was supposed, of course, always to be a, a projection or a manifestation of the supreme artist of all, Elias Artista. And he would come into the laboratory without giving his name. He came in sometimes through the walls without opening a door. He said a few words to the alchemist, gave him the answer to his question, and then disappeared and was never seen again by that alchemist. But the whole theory behind, of course, the whole theory is that alchemy was the science of regeneration. If the disciple is dedicated to self-discipline, the correction of personal weaknesses, the gradual improvement of his own life, and never for a moment compromises this improvement, he may in due time have that moment's visit from Elias Artista, the one who will give him the answer. Now, in the actual life of the human being, we have to realize, as was true of St. Francis of Assisi, Raymond Lilly, many others, that the human being is not perfect, he is not going to easily become perfect. Furthermore, that the experiences of imperfection are very important. The individual who has never made a mistake has seldom ever done anything well, because it is necessary to grow through mistakes grow through doing things that perhaps are repented. We all do these things in spite of our good intentions. But as we become more and more dedicated to the realities, we begin to reinterpret our own mistakes. We find that these mistakes become partial, at least, proof of the very truth we are seeking. We begin to realize how we did it not so well and begin to realize how we can do it better. Little by little, the past with its mistakes is transmuted, like the base metals of alchemy, into a realization of the disciplines that are necessary to our own growth. So today, with these various organizations that appear, I have not, in writing, ever discussed the merits or demerits of contemporary organizations. I don't want to do this, because it can only lead to endless difficulty inasmuch as evidences that are acceptable are difficult to find. And it becomes a battle of convictions in which people are hurt, people are discouraged, and it all ends in nothing. There is no way of solving it this way. Rather, instead of that, I'd like to put the emphasis where it seems to me that it really belongs. That the only way that the individual can surely and truly uh, attain the contact with the Hermetic mystery, as it is described uh, by Mrs. Atwood in her work on alchemy. Uh, the Hermetic mystery is something that is discovered through the transmutation of self. It is something that arises from gradual control of the factors of life. 
No one is going to contact these esoteric systems by desperation. They are no, they're not going to get there by a verbal dedication. They are not going to get there by a contribution, no matter how generous it is. They cannot. The answer is they, they have to reach it through the gradual development of the faculties within themselves by means of which uh, they are able to attain contact with these esoteric schools. One uh, oriental system pointed out very clearly that the magnetic field of the human body is like the furnace of the alchemist. This magnetic field is varicolored, and it is ch its hues are continuously changing. And every major trend in the disposition results in a major change in the colors, tones, and qualities of the light emanating from the human body. Therefore, thought forms become very important. And the radiance coming from these thought forms are believed, to these radiances, are believed to be the basis of the recognition of the spiritual development of an individual. If these radiances are sufficiently powerful and sufficiently clear, then anyone who knows can interpret them. And if there is a light by which the individual can be seen by some esoteric institution, it is through these radiances changing within his own constitution. These things cannot be faked. The radiance cannot be hidden, nor can any mistaken interpretation modify its coloration or its intensity. Everything that has to do with the divine chemistry in man has to be completely honest. And every re effect of this type of re regeneration is completely evident in the, in the life of the person and in the development of the magnetic field. So we start by assuming what we have to assume, that the individual has to earn the right to these things truth must be earned. It must be earned by the individual realizing that he is, in a sense, in exile. He is in a condition natural and proper to the lack of perfection of his own vehicles. Evolution has been a constant description, description and revelation of the unfoldment of instruments. The body unfolds. The faculties become stronger. The propensities are intensified. Evolution produces higher and higher species, like the chambered story of the Nautilus, in which the Nautilus is always building more beautiful mansions for its soul. But the individual must also build these mansions for his soul. There must be this constant improvement of the inner life and the effort to conceal the weakness of the internal by strengthening the external is a dismal failure. I would suggest then that those who are really sincere look very carefully at what they become involved in in order that they may not make a mistake which they will regret. On the other hand, if they do make a mistake, they should not be in despair because the mistake is not primarily the fact that they have been deceived. The real fact is the mistake is because they have deceived themselves. The individual cannot be deceived if his own integrities cannot be tempted, or he cannot be lured away from the facts of life into some false doctrine which cannot produce the goals which he seeks. No doctrine can grow for another person. No individual can grow because of another person helping him to grow. The other person may give him certain instruction, may inspire him, but every action of life that is a growth must be motivated by the person who is seeking to grow. His friends, his teachers, all those around him can help, but no one can grow for someone else any more than one person can digest food for another. It is absolutely necessary that growth be the result of personal improvement. Now, in Christendom, we also have another interesting parallel to the adept tradition, and that is the story of the saints. The Western world has gradually substituted the saint concept for the ancient ahats and uh, 
Rishis of the East. The saints become again intercessors between man and divinity. These saints are miniature saviors. They possess something of the power of the sacrifice they have made for the good of the world. And from this sacrifice, a certain sanctity has been bestowed upon themselves. The saint, therefore, is in a sense another example of the uh, esoteric tradition, the hierarchy. The saints become an order of intermediaries between deity and mankind. If this has any foundation in validity, and it is held as sacred by hundreds of millions of people, it is because of this very fact that the individual who loses his life or gives his life for a principle greater than himself shall have life everlasting. The uh, saint is most commonly canonized because of martyrdom. And this martyrdom is the giving of all of self unselfishly to the glory of God on the service of each other. This constitutes then what to the ancient esoteric orders would be the qualification necessary for participation in the esoteric circle of illumination. Uh, the uh, saint becomes the symbol of the person who has achieved the complete renunciation of himself in the service of others. That he becomes capable, therefore, of interceding and becomes an intercessor, as all the world teachers have been, by means of which the, the eternal power of things is refreshed and restored in confidence by the proof that among its creatures there are those who are moving definitely and dedicatedly toward union with itself. Therefore, those who become dedicated have certain virtues, certain powers, and certain authorities vested in them. And this concept leads, of course, to the concept, finally, that these together become the interpreters of the law. They are interpreters not on our level, but on the level of absolute unselfishness absolute impersonality, absolute obedience. These things are a little hard for Western man to accept. We have gradually become more and more convinced of our own importance. We have more or less felt that some way we were going to change the world. But the more effort we put in that direction, the more we endanger the world. Because that which attempts to solve problems by force, by strength, by wealth, by authority, all of these conditions are ultimately failures. There were times in the early history of mankind when there were shepherd kings guarding the destiny of mortals, where it, according to Homer and others of the ancient world, the gods walked with men. They descended as teachers and guardians and guides, and they spoke through the prophets of old, as we find in the Old Testament. But gradually something else happened. As the individual grows up, he is no longer uh, dependent upon elders entirely. He, can, he cannot be trained by being forced to perform certain virtuous actions. He cannot be made honest by being whipped if he is dishonest. He cannot become virtuous because he is published, uh, punished as a criminal. The individual must make these changes of himself, in himself, and by himself. He must gradually build up these values which he knows to be right. Gradually, therefore, the shepherd kings vanished from the world, and the individual became a self-reliant individual, uh, possessing uh, what St. Thomas Aquinas called a limited determinism, the right to choose to do right. And this choice to do right voluntarily uh, met the individual actually choosing to, su to supply his inner life with greater integrities has made an important personal step. It is very much more important to make one small step in the one's own way than to be pushed into something that appears to be much greater. So that in the gradual evolution of the great mystery school, which is the world, the individual has had to make decisions, and these decisions are the basis of his spiritual development and the maturity of his soul. He must choose these things in the presence 
of temptation. He must recognize that when it appears most likely that he might succeed materially, it is also possible that he might fail in the great purposes of life. Consequently, there must be always this uh, continuous stress upon personal integrities, personal dedications, and personal purifications. We honor most the great teachers of our race. We honor those who have sacrificed life and time and have also brought us the deepest and most wonderful revelations that the world has ever received. We respect these people. We honor them. We build temples, churches, synagogues, and mosques in their honor. Uh, we create priesthoods to serve them. We support their material needs with generous contributions. We respect them in every way, and yet for some strange reason we cannot live according to the teachings that they give us. We continue to make the common mistakes that our ancestors made 10,000 years ago. We still cannot escape the power of ego the power of self-will coming into conflict with divine will. Therefore, if we really want to understand the esoteric tradition and hope that sometime we might be worthy to have direct contact with it through rep reputable and proper instruments, we have to carefully explore all of the teachings that are now circulated under those terms. We have to look at the revelations attributed to prophets and uh, teachers to make sure that those revelations are a challenge to our integrities and not a justification of our weaknesses. We have to be sure that we are going to be disciplined, not that we are going to be relieved of discipline, that we are going to have to live better, not finding ways to gain the ends we want without the corrections of our own faults. No amount of believing will protect us if we do not live according to the belief that we hold. And uh, a great believing is sometimes too much for us. We have an idea of some very great, wonderful thing that might happen, and in the presence of it, we are unable to face the small problems of the day. Beliefs should be simple. They should be within our comprehension. And as our comprehension increases, our believing will be enriched. But it must begin with simple and gentle convictions. If we can uh, work with these problems, we will then probably find, as we have in the past, that there will be powerful restorations of esoteric knowledge. There will be reformations in our system of schooling. Little by little, these changes are taking place now. Opinions that 20 years ago were considered heresy from a scientific standpoint are now regarded with considerable interest and attention. Little by little, the secret way of life is coming through. It is coming through because we are in desperate need of it. It also is coming through because all physical or mortal knowledge leads finally in the direction of metaphysical and immortal knowledge. It is only that we have to allow it to unfold. If, however, we lock our material knowledge in prejudiced attitudes, if we continue to bind our spirits and our souls to the millstone of the Philistines, then these other things simply cannot happen. But each person has one other consolation to bear in mind, namely that if the integrity is what it ought to be, no condition of society can stand between the individual and the enlightenment that he deserves. No amount of corruption can destroy the just person. No amount of pressure, circumstance, or tragedy can take away the integrity of the person who is really dedicated to the principles of truth and light. He can go on. He does not have to be supported by his society, or his family, or his friends, or his nation, or his world. It is his privilege to live his beliefs. It is his privilege to continue to grow, because actually his growth is not a public event. This is where trouble gets in. When we try to proclaim our growth, it is questioned. But if quietly we grow so that people do not question our growth because they see it, then we are in a much more secure position. No one can stop us. Even the greatest tyrant cannot prevent us from growing. If our growth is turned toward our inner life, 
and not in conflict with outer circumstances. The individual, by releasing themselves from the worldliness in themselves, transcend the power of worldly authority to destroy them. They keep on growing in their own proper and natural way. So we, uh, we really recommend that most people begin to think seriously about the invisible government of the world, that it is our only hope that we know perfectly well that our own politicians are not going to get us there. We know definitely that unless there is an integrity in space, there is little hope for us. But if there is an integrity in space, then integrity is indestructible. We will achieve that which we deserve. And the universe has this vast mechanism, referred to as hierarchy, to make sure that the just person is given the enlightenment that he deserves and to make sure that all injustice is finally corrected and that in the end we shall live to become part of the universal plan and not in a desperate effort to create some type of an economic empire in the material world. We have to live in this world but we have to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But we also have to render unto God the things that are his. And our eternal destiny, our souls, our hearts, our minds, our labors, in our integrities, all are the things that we must render unto God. Because deity is the source of all good in ourselves. And that good we must bring as an offering to the world, to our neighbor, to the divine power which fashioned it. So in this type of thinking, we can perhaps gain some, uh, you know, support from the realization that out there somewhere is a plan that will not fail, and that it has been served for countless ages by dedicated beings of this world or of some other who have transcended all human limitations and have outgrown all human ambitions and desires and live only that the will of heaven be done. And they become the instruments of that will. And as we become, even in a small way, little instruments in that will and of that will, we too begin to share in its eternity. And in our own lives, we have a growth that will give us peace of soul, even under the pressure of present world conditions. And at this season of the resurrection, it is particularly fitting that we bear these thoughts in mind that the world has not been left without hope, that man has not been left without the key to unlock his own destiny, but the individual must use the integrities he has to perfect those integrities which must yet be developed within his own nature. When he is capable of doing this, he will fulfill the law and will live for the glory of God and the well-being of all creatures that exist. This is a proper thought, it seems to me, for this particular season of the year. Well, folks, that's that for this morning. And uh, I'd like to make an announcement or two. At this season of the year, I really always announce something that my wife is working on. And uh, the program for the development of the uh, Br Bruton Vault, the opening of Bruton Vault, Williamsburg, this program is gaining considerable mom momentum and more and more people are becoming concerned with it. And we hope that if you do not have a copy of her little book, Foundations on Earth, that you will secure a copy because there is really quite a lot of activity after many years, probably because the time has come when the average person is more and more concerned with the protection of the entire world and less and less concerned with the success of his own small enterprises. On the same basis, we, she has another publication which I think you would enjoy, and that is World and Family Enlightenment. We were out last evening to see a very lovely family that has a new six-month-old baby daughter. These people are really very fine people, and their it's efforts to be right in this world, to do what is right, should not only be respected, but it should be strengthened by information, by a broader understanding of life and what relationships are. 
And my wife, in her little publication, uh, World and Family Relations, gives a picture of a family of worlds, a family of nations, a family of people, which I think you will enjoy and may help you to make this Easter significant. We thank you for being with you, us, and we hope to see you in the near future.